So let's go. <clears throat> During this session, I'm going to go over the uh, majority concept of Project Olympics very, very uh, briefly, uh, introduce the uh, GPUs that we selected for this expansion box, um, mention the collaboration we've had with uh, our partners, um, go over some of the enabling components that we've designed, um, high-level feature sets of the expansion box, and um, use cases and performance uh, will be covered by my colleague, Robert Over from NVIDIA. Okay, so this should be familiar to you now. Uh, we are taking advantage of the fact that Project Olympus is a modular architecture. We covered a couple of expansion boxes this morning. Um, JBOT and JBOF are good examples. Uh, we did cover a number of uh, servers, the, defining modularity and taking advantage of the fact that multiple servers can fit. Uh, today, we're going to talk about another expansion box that uh, uh, provides uh, a PCIe expansion to GPUs. So, to start with that, uh, we, ha we need a very good GPU. A uh, very good GPU is NVIDIA Pascal uh, SXM2 that's uh, been released. It is in production. And uh, at Microsoft, we have taken advantage of it, and we like it. So uh, what it takes for us to do is then uh, build a chassis around it, yeah. collaborate with our partners, uh, build a chassis that is extensible, flexible, and connects to the rest of Project Olympus so we can take advantage of the baseline features of Project Olympus server, as an example. Um, during the overview, you saw um, rack management, BIOS, firmware, power, cooling. All of those are taken care of within Project Olympus architecture. So what we need to do is focus on an expansion box and take advantage of the baseline features of Project Olympus server, for example. So uh, we partnered with um, Foxconn and Gracis and NVIDIA to uh, complete this chassis. For the expansion box, it connects to a uh, two-socket Project Olympus server as a head node. So if you were to look at it, you can see that we interconnect the head node to the expansion chassis using cables. You see? Cables are right behind a, a Faraday cage, so they are considered internal cables for EMI contamination, containment, for example. <coughs> Uh, any hardware is no good without software, so um, the applications that could take advantage of this hardware are HPC, video transcoding, machine learning, uh, DNN of different kinds. Uh, you are probably familiar with Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit. That is the platform framework that allows uh, multiple GPUs interconnect and cluster together and scale up or scale out to uh, perform large-scale machine learning jobs. Uh, the P100 SXM2 is a very good choice for machine learning, but for us to have the flexibility of having PCIe adding cards as well, we have uh, developed a uh, adapter module, a mezzanine, that you probably saw it in the booth, to uh, translate the uh, baseboard to PCIe slots. So the two boxes are exactly the same, but different modules plug in. To have an extensible um, interconnect, we take advantage of both NVMe, uh, I'm sorry, uh, NVLink for peer-to-peer, -peer, but PCIe to the host. 
Uh, in this particular topology, you see that uh, we're using PCIe switches. Each PCIe switch has uh, three by 16 links dedicated to PCIe slots or GPUs. They have one by 16 link to interconnect to each other, uh, inter-switch links, and they provide two by 16 links uh, to outside world. So at the chassis level, there are eight by 16 PCIe links available, and we can connect them to a large host, or we can use them to interconnect multiple chassis together. To enable what we needed, uh, we have a number of small add-ins to the Project Olympus server. Uh, as an example, we have three different riser boards that plug into PCIe slots, provide uh, Oculink cables that then Oculink cables interconnect to the chassis. Um, I also mentioned that um, we have mezzanine adapters to translate PCIe from the baseboard to provide PCIe slots. There are a number of variations of that mezzanine board possible. Uh, we have thought of several of those, and it's up to you guys to go dream up other solutions and design to that as well. A brief on the PCIe topology. Uh, we wanted to have very good host bandwidth and peer-to-peer -peer bandwidth. So this diagram is depicting how the four PCIe switches on the baseboard are interconnected or can be interconnected. Some of these links are fixed, and as I said, each PCIe switch provides two by 16 as a connector, so there are variable. We can interconnect them based on different configurations. The box to the left is depicting the full chassis, and it is showing how many links are available to be interconnected to other chassis. As an example, if we were to interconnect two chassis, this is an example of uh, PCIe switch to switch interconnect. And this is a physical uh, picture of what we've done. Uh, you can see there is a server in the middle and an expansion box is on the top. And the server, through the riser board that I mentioned, through the Oculink cables internal to the chassis, connects to the expansion box. We also have a chimney concept that these cables can go from one chassis to the chassis above. So up to four of these chassis can be interconnected using what could be considered as internal cables. So that reduces the serviceability problem, reduces EMI um, emission. So a high-level feature set of the box. Um, we need a lot of power, so we have six power supplies, 1,600 watt each, in a form of N plus N, uh, modeled after Project Olympus power distribution in that we have two feeds of three phase each. They're uh, redundant. Uh, we have 12 fans, 60 millimeter fans, for adequate cooling for such a large uh, power load. As I mentioned, um, the PCIe cables are in the form of 16 by 8 cables. So we have the flexibility of using them as by 8 or combining them to be 8 by 16s. Different workloads may require different interconnect. We also support uh, four uh, full-height, three-quarter length PCIe slots for other functions, NICs, InfiniBand cards, 
or even M.2 modules, very similar to what we talked about earlier in the form of uh, AVA card, for example. Um, we follow a similar management solution. The uh, Open BMC is a target for us here for BMC. And uh, to interconnect to the rest of the FRAC, to the rack manager, we have a sideband uh, channel for power and presence detect. So as I mentioned, uh, we're offering flexibility in the piece, uh, uh, GPUs also. Uh, P100SXM2 is the primary target. However, we can support PCIe cards as well. Four of these chassis can be interconnected to form a cluster of 32 GPUs plus uh, 16 other functional PCIe cards. I'm sorry. Four chassis interconnected. Each chassis has eight GPUs and four other PCIe slots. Okay. So uh, I give the mic to Robert, my colleague from NVIDIA. He's going to go over some use cases and different workloads and performance. Thanks. Um, oh. okay. Thank you. The clicker is helpful. Um, I wanted to uh, take a little bit of a different spin on this. And, and say, um, when we started working with a lot of the, the cloud vendors and getting traction, a lot of people were doing deep learning or creating HPC instances and that. We started to realize, I mean, I mean it sounds probably um, you know, obvious to most of the people in the room, but we started to realize that cloud vendors really had different motivations. It's one thing to make the best uh, deep learning platform in the world or the best HPC platform in the world. That's a single use case you can optimize, but it's quite a different motivation when you're a cloud vendor and you need to, um, you need to supply all sorts of instances. Some of them might be um, you know, uh, really low latency, granular kind of inference, maybe something like uh, you know, voice, uh, voice translation or, or voice recognition, or it might be some batch uh, you know, high throughput things like you know, tagging photos as people upload them or doing video, video inference or transcode. Um, there are HPC workloads in the cloud, you know, things that uh, traditional work, uh, things like computational uh, fluid dynamics or uh, you know, uh, protein folding and modeling. Um, and then there are things like DevOps, where you know, somebody needs just one GPU to start doing some software development, some tuning, some experimentation, and then eventually deploy it into production on some framework, so high volume training of terabytes of data in a very high performance cluster of GPUs. That's a really tough thing to, um, to you, you know, how, how do you deploy that in the cloud? And our vision was really, um, we came up with something that we felt was sort of the universal GPU. So it's the highest performance thing for HPC and deep learning. It's also extraordinarily good at all the other workloads. I mean, it'll even run uh, things like uh, VDI and, and graphics. So um, we had this vision, universal GPU, but we really needed a partner who also understood the cloud environment and had a similar vision. And we really found the partner in Microsoft and in Gracious in that they had the motivation to deploy in the cloud multiple instances with one physical SKU. So incredible adaptability was really uh, the driving force here. And I think you've seen how adaptable it is. Um, so you've, you've already seen this. The, the interesting thing that makes this so adaptable, um, CMAX already run through this, is the incredibly rich PCIe complex so that I can configure the attachment to different host nodes. I could have multiple servers attached to these. I could have an incredibly high bandwidth attachment for certain workloads, deep learning, uh, deep learning training, for example. I can have 
less bandwidth attached if a workload doesn't require it. I can split this up into multiple instances if I want to uh, you know, provide that DevOps single GPU instance. And then I've also got multiple slots, so I could attach um, uh, InfiniBand or, or RDME Ethernet. I could even attach storage for you know, vast pools of training data. It's incredibly malleable. And then as the base platform, I have the highest performance GPU for deep learning training or HPC possible. It is it. Um, the NVLink allows uh, most of the data to flow between the GPUs, you know, for the really performance critical steps in deep learning or HPC. But with adapters, I can actually load the same enclosure with different GPUs that are optimized for different workloads. There may be a reason why I want to use something different. So incredibly uh, adaptable and powerful, it can, it can scale anything from uh, you know, running people's virtual desktops to running the highest performance deep learning training workloads in the world. If you look at some of the ways um, you can configure these, and these are, these are cartoon, you know, just kind of how you would set it up. On the left is sort of the canonical deep learning training machine, right? Uh, a dual socket node, rich, rich bandwidth interconnect to provide training data to the GPU complex, really powerful uh, GPU complex. Most of the data is flowing between the GPUs on the NV link. Each of, these, uh, each of those links is 20 gigabytes per second, dual, duplex, 16 links, incredible bandwidth, and it really makes a big difference in the overall throughput and performance. That's uh, essentially, a, uh, that's a supercomputer in a box right there. On the right, there, there are options. You can scale out, um, you, can, you can add more GPUs. We, we need work in the frameworks. They don't really support this yet, but we can get there. Um, for an HPC workload, I could start with the same canonical uh, deep learning platform on the left, or I could reconfigure and tune it more for an HPC workload. So I could start uh, balancing on the left, balancing the CPU resources a little closer with the GPU resources. I can start slicing up. For example, I would separate the two clusters of by four here, by four GPUs. One cluster, one host, one cluster, one host. Or I can partition it even further and get closer to what is really uh, uh, you know, a very typical HPC deployment. So I have an almost, or I have a one-to-one -one relationship between a processor socket and a GPU, very balanced for HPC workloads. So this becomes four nodes in an HPC scale-out complex. So we can make ad adaptations like this for any of the workloads, for inference, for, for uh, virtual desktop, for any of the workloads we can optimize. And the sort of thing, depending on what you're optimizing for, it may be more of an economic benefit, it might be a performance benefit. I wanted to highlight this, this one particular thing, because if I start with the canonical, on the left, the deep learning platform, it's really good at HPC, but when you reconfigure it and change the balance, it actually becomes better. So, um, you know, CPU on HPC workload, uh, this is CUDA. Um, K80s, which is the current highest performance GPU generally available in the cloud, extraordinarily high performance. When you move to P100 SXM um, in the canonical, uh, canonical configuration, extraordinary improvement in performance. But overall, if I'm trying to get the most work out of that enclosure, if I reconfigure the, um, the server nodes attached, I can actually get a little more capability out of the same system. So that's, I just wanted to leave you with that, uh, that example of how refactoring the system can actually have an impact on the work you can get out of the system. I'll leave it on that. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for some questions, if you like. Uh, just to reiterate what Robert just said, um, the, the choice of chassis, we have already designed it flexible enough for the expansion chassis, but the choice of the processor modules that go in there is still free. So 
so you guys can participate in what kind of processor complex and go in there. Uh, two socket, four socket, single socket, two at a time, four at a time, eight at a time. So there is, there is a lot that you guys can participate. I was just wondering, like, how does AMD GPUs compare with, of course, NVIDIA is the king, but say if I have three years out, uh, what technical differences would it be? Why isn't AMD ready right now? Uh, I, I, can, I can either answer in a very shallow or a very deep way. Um, the, Okay, so well, I'll, shallow. It's you just benchmark, and it's a, it's a world apart. Um, uh, the deeper answer is that um, we're actually architecting um, the GPUs for deep learning, and we're uh, driving a, a lot of the software stack. So we we've created all of the libraries from the from the lowest level um, up through you know, so CUDA, CUDA, and then. Um, uh, and we've worked closely with all the framework developers so that it really is a um, highly optimized platform. I uh, just had a question on the uh, architecture. I noticed you, are, you guys are using the Express Fabric switches to connect the hosts to the uh, NVIDIA GPUs down below. Uh, the question was, the software for the fabric manager, is that also open source or is this something? Uh... Well, um, very good observation. To, to support multi-chassis interconnect, we do need uh, a fabric manager. And we are developing one, but um, as the system is a modular system, uh, you're more than welcome to participate or include your own uh, uh, fabric manager software that can enhance the capabilities. Uh, for your multi-chassis connection, so let's say you have two, uh, two chassis. Would the other chassis the pro processor also consider a host? Or just one as a host machine? Well, uh, in a, in a multi-chassis environment, uh, if the two chassis are only these expansion chassis, there's no host involved yet. But uh, the topology that I showed, one host connects to both chassis. So in that model, there is only one host and an expanded version of PCIe complex. Uh, yes, and however, uh, the, the PCIe switch fabric is capable of multi-hosting as well, yep. so we can take it the other way around. You can start with one expansion chassis and have more than one host connecting to it. You know, you but there, there, are, there are complexities to work out. Uh, the fabric manager is one of the complexities that allows that. I, I actually wanted to put a finer point on that. They, uh, I, I can actually imagine some really crazy topologies where you might have, you know, pick your number of servers, maybe four attached to a bunch of a uh, bunch of expansion systems, all in one fabric. And logically, depending on what instances you want to deploy, you might configure who's connected to who, right? So it's it's in it, it's unbelievably flexible, and we could create things that we could never really use. Uh, sorry, guys, uh, time is short, and we have a lot of wonderful things to cover, and we have three more sessions coming up. Uh, thank you again. Thanks, Robert.